Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to listen tonight. Welcome to our isolation. Uh, we miss your smiling faces. Our topic tonight that we're considering is the fairness of faith. So come along for the journey and we'll see what we can work out. I'm going to tell you a story about your grandfather um, and one of his friends. So um, your grandfather was born just at the beginning of the Great Depression um, in the 1921 and um, basically he, uh, he grew up in Southside Sydney and he, uh, he lived in a big family, 12 children and he had a really good friend, had a really good friend, his name was Norman. And he and Norman grew up together and so when they were your ages, like 9 and 11, they were just having a ball, getting around in the bush, going fishing, catching crayfish, doing all sorts of cool things for them. And so their life was pretty good um, at that time. And, uh, and so as they got older and older, they, um, they turned into teenagers and then they went away together and they did all sorts of great adventures. Now eventually the Second World War came and Norman enlisted into the army, and he went off to he went off to fight the Japanese in um, Papua New Guinea. And uh, and your your grandfather he was a conscientious objector, so he had to help out driving trucks and stuff in Australia for the sort of war effort here um, because he wasn't willing to go away and fight. And so after the war finished, uh, they they both came home eventually. Um, and they, they basically lived very close to each other and um, as it was, uh, life didn't go so great for, for Norman. He broke up with his wife and um, he ended up a bit of a broken man and he was like living eventually with his mum, um, his old mum who was a lovely lady. And so when I was a little boy, I used to go around and visit my father's best friend who lived in this house that was sort of becoming very dilapidated and um, it was a bit like they had the Triffids and the trees had grown up all around it and there were vines coming in through the roof and there were all sorts of things happening and eventually his, his old mum Daisy died and he was living there on his own and this guy had become you know, very overweight he had um, great big thick glasses on and um, the one thing that him, he and my dad used to like do was talk about fishing and Norman was a great collector of fishing magazines and fishing um, uh, reels and rods. But the thing, funny thing was he never went fishing because he was too overweight and he really never left the house just to go to the doctors. So his life was pretty, pretty rough. And yet he and my father had been friends since they were really, really little and basically their lives had traveled on parallel ridges. And so um, it was that um, my, your grandfather, my dad, he also used to give Norman lots of um, interesting books on Jesus and God. And so Norman was a, he was a, he was a reader. So the one thing he did do was read. And he read and he read and he read. He read all sorts of things. And he had all these funny expressions because he was kind of lost in his books. And he was always telling me, you know, he said this or according to Hoyle. And I was always a kid wondering who these people were and who he was because he always spoke in this strange way. And yet, um, Time went on, and I was the I was the, the youngest in my family. My father was was seventy, and Norman turned seventy, and um, all of a sudden one day he said to my dad, "I really want to get baptized. I really believe in in God and Jesus, and I want to get baptized." And so, at seventy, they got this huge guy, and they put him in a bath, they filled it with water, and they they baptized him, and um, he came up out of the water. He was like a new person. He suddenly wanted to go to lots of things. He wanted to go fishing. He hadn't gone fishing for maybe 40 years, 50 years. Um, and, uh, and suddenly his life was changed. He had a new lease of life and he wanted to do things again. But the sad part is he only lasted another year and then he had a great big heart attack and died. Um, and that was the end of his life. So um, yeah, it's a bit of an interesting story, but a good story because you know, he had hope 
that he was going to be um, raised and that his faith would make him whole. The parable of the labourers in the vineyard, Matthew 20 verses, um, from verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire labourers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the labourers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing, and he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the labourers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at their master of the house saying, these last only worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. So um, with the story of my father and his best friend, Norman, uh, that's a great story for me. It's been one that's been with me for a long time and um, I was part of that story as well because I used to go around and help help out around at Norman's house and one stage I, I cut all the trees down and cleaned up his property to keep him from being like evicted by the local council. And um, he was somebody who was a real massive character in my childhood. And um, I just find it amazing that um, it took him all of that lifetime to get to the point where he had faith. And so um, for some, from somebody who I, I pretty well found my faith when I was um, in my late teens, um, it's very different um, to see that looking back at someone's life who'd had all this time and all these dramas and problems in their life and then they found faith and their life was over. And so it's, um, it's something that uh, is incredible, but also has explained to me that faith is a very fair thing. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't matter who you are or what you know or where you've come from or how smart you are or how, how intelligent you are. Faith is not really based on that. It's based on your response to God. And so um, for Norman, his response to God came in his 70th year. And for other people, it might come when they're 12 or 13 or, or um, in their 20s or 30s. It just depends. And so uh, it's, it's, it's a great thing and it's like a baseline leveler of humanity. And so I think faith is, I call it the fairness of faith because really God has come up with a, a way of pleasing him which is open to all people of every type in the world. Let's have a look at Matthew, um, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. This is a point where Jesus goes up into a mountain and it says, Seeing the crowds... He went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so 
this beautiful poem that Jesus writes here, this, this beautiful poem has this one verse in it that says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The question is, how does someone hunger and thirst for righteousness? And what is righteousness? And so faith can be seen as a way to righteousness with God. And we know that Abraham it said in, in um, Genesis Three, chapter six, uh, Genesis 3 verse 6 that Abraham believed in God and it was credited to him for righteousness and so um, these people here are hungering and thirsting after being right with God and he says they're going to be filled they're going to be satisfied for that. and so that's a fantastic thing to think about is that if you want to be right with God then believe in him show confidence in him have fidelity in God and he'll, he will reward you, just like he rewarded the people in the, who came and worked in the vineyard. Sometimes as we're traveling through the forest of life, we look around and we see just trees are everywhere, but we can't see the forest because all we're seeing are the trees. And so Jesus gave us a way of navigating through life, trusting in him and trusting in his father, God who made everything that they had a plan for us a plan that we could move through life trusting in them believing in them and come out the other end of this forest to a whole new world a world of possibilities a world of amazing eternal life and so this is the hope this is the hope that Abraham had this is the hope that David had and this is the hope that Jesus preached and taught during his time on earth. And so today, hopefully, we can have another look at the idea of this incredible fairness of faith as we journey through our life. So faith's not an end in itself. It's a way that we get somewhere. It's just like a car. It's our own personal faith mobile. We're heading off towards the kingdom. We're taking in the scenery, we're coming having adventures, and eventually we're going to get to the place that Jesus wants us to be. So if you see us your faith like a vehicle, it's a vehicle to eternity. Hebrews chapter eleven, the faith chapter. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to leap in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who was promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, 
and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. It's one of the favourite things that in our whole house is this amazing painting, which was done by a friend of mine in Sydney. And um, it's of the scene where Abraham gets um, given promises by God. I just want to draw your attention to one spot up here in verse 6. So this is Genesis 15, verse 6, and it says, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. What a cool idea. So Abraham, while he was wandering around in the land of promise, believed in God. And God went, you know what, Abraham, because you believed in me, I'm gonna, you're going to be right with me. You're going to be perfectly right with me. And that was a huge thing. And Abraham never forgot that, that he was right with God. And that's what faith can do for you.